Hey, welcome to Tank Talk. I'm your host, Bob Tankard. And this evening's guest is Nancy uh, Steinbeck, which is speech and language pathologist. Nancy, welcome to Tank Talk. Thank you. Nancy, again. we were on, oh, probably a year ago almost. Yeah, it was you were in on, March of last year. Tell us a little bit about Nancy, where you're from, you know, how'd you come to Martha's Vineyard, like all the rest of us and whatnot? Well, I think that I would definitely fall under the category of a wash ashore. I um, have been on the vineyard uh, for 21 years. Really? But not working on mm -hmm. the vineyard. I was working outside of New York City in private practice and mm -hmm. collaborating with um, um, child psychiatrists and mm -hmm. teachers and stuff. But I came out of City University of New York Hunter College in the 70s when they were beginning to look at older children and making these connections so that it was no longer minimal brain damage, but oh, by the way, we need to see these as being children with language problems that then go on to become what we call the LD children mm -hmm. of the learning disabled children of uh, school age. So after I practiced there, I went to Italy for 15 years and mm -hmm. I worked in um, English language acquisition and also trying to work with challenged learners there. But I came back and st to live here full time mm -hmm. and hopefully to be able to contribute to the community so that we can have um, an additional independent resource mm -hmm. so that when schools uh, can't manage or people need to have additional services, rather than having to go off island, we could have a resource here yeah. in terms of a speech and language mm -hmm. clinic. So tell me, you know, when you, you know, we, when you go back to speech and language, uh, re, you know, stuff like that, I can remember way back when I was a kid, yeah. back in the, in the dark ages, you know, a, a lot of us went to reading specialists, yes. and they taught us how to read in the first and second grade and whatnot, okay, along with the teacher and whatnot. And then those that had usually speech impediments went to the speech teacher, mm -hmm. you know, and I remember working with a young lady uh, we almost shared the same office when I was at the Tisbury School, and she would teach kids that had speech impediments, you know, how to, you know, errors, and yeah. whatnot. Then all of a sudden things began to change. You know, uh, uh, down the road, you know, kids came into the system. They were screened at an early age, go to either go into kindergarten or whatnot, and uh, it became more of a. They, they almost changed it from speech. Or, or language to learning, mm -hmm. learning disorders, you know, and then those things sh showed up in the learner. Explain that, because I don't think some people understand what speech and language people, pathologists do, versus my child has a learning disorder. You know what I'm right. talking about? Yes, I do. Um, I think that I want to approach that from a couple of perspectives. I think the first thing is, is that you're right. There used to be like the speech therapist, right? right? And the speech therapist primarily worked on articulation. Right. But then what began to happen is um, in about the 60s and going into the 70s, people then began to look at child language. Mm -hmm. And when we began to look at child language, that obviously fell into the domain of a speech pathologist. Mm -hmm. And so in some of the really top-notch programs, Emerson, for example, right. City University, out west, in the Midwest, um, speech language pathologists became much more involved in looking at and diagnosing kids with language learning disorders. Okay. So a language learning disorder... But, the, but the, did that come out of, when you said diagnosis, did that come out of the big... Uh, medical institutions. Okay, I think that to it, to to schools or to specialists, I think and not that, into schools. Yeah, I think that what happened is it came out of um, research institutions. Okay. okay, university institutions that also could be tied to um, hospital settings. Mm -hmm. So I think that what happened is is that a lot of times you have to do a clinical fellowship year right. after you finish training. So I think that in the course of that speech language pathologists went into different settings. Okay. Um, I had made a decision early on, my first degree had been in um, liberal arts, mm -hmm. which unfortunately people don't do anymore today. Mm -hmm. When I was in school, it was one in four students was a liberal arts okay. major. Now it's one in 20. And certainly teachers tend to go into teaching and SLPs now as speech language pathologists, they tend to like follow this track. So 
what ended up happening was I decided I didn't want to go into schools. I wanted to really be able to cross a lot of different areas. Mm -hmm. And that's why I went into the work that I did so that when I left my doctoral studies um, and went to work at Greenwich Hospital in Greenwich, Connecticut, um, a colleague with whom I'd been in mm -hmm. the doctoral program, she and I started a very strong child language program. It used to be that speech language pathologists did everything. Okay. They did children and they did adults in right, these settings. Right. But I was really interested in older children, which they were beginning to look at now, and that then became a very rich area. Do me a favor, explain to the audience what a speech pathologist does. does. Okay. Okay. I know. I think that sometimes that's really misunderstood. Well, yeah, I think so. A speech language pathologist is charged. I'm going to be talking about child language today. I'm not okay. going to talk about adults. Okay. A speech language pathologist, depending on the setting, um, is charged with trying to suss out mm -hmm. uh, speech and language behaviors that can be related to communication problems. And when would you pick that up in a child? Interestingly, you can now begin to do that in infancy. Really? Yeah. And there's some wonderful um, work now by Patricia um, Kuhl, who is not a speech language pathologist, but she's looking at um, when babies, we're talking mm -hmm. about infants, right, right. begin to become aware of speech sounds, which we know about. But now what she's doing is we're doing much more work in looking at neural connections. We didn't have that when I was in school. We didn't have MRI. Mm -hmm. We suspected those things, mm -hmm. but we didn't have it. So what ends up happening is there are some speech pathologists who become general practitioners, right. and you may find them in a general hospital, for right. example, like here on the island. Right. There are school uh, speech pathologists, and they can have different roles depending upon the school and how um, inclusive they are across classroom teachers, reading teachers, and mm -hmm. speech language pathologists right. and psychologists. And then you have um, a significant group of people like me who work across a number of domains. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at oral language, but in that um, endeavor, uh, starting in very, very early childhood, I'm also beginning to uh, be concerned or to begin to think about what's going to happen with that child in school. I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, now you explained a little bit about the speech pathologist's position, right? If a parent was saying to one to tell you, what signs would I pick up from my child mm -hmm. at, say, four months old, five months old, when they can get an understanding of sound and, and stuff like that, that they may have a uh, deficiency in, in language, what are some of the signs do I look at? What are the, some of the signs that... I may say, oh, wait a minute, something's happening here. I think that's an because interesting... Because I don't know, because the reason why I say it, mm -hmm. I know that years ago, when I was in education years ago, <clears throat> when a child was going into kindergarten, they did a test. Yeah, they did a test. Okay. Did Whether the test covered all that, I, I can't really tell you, but I know they did a certain test. <clears throat> and then they started doing tests for preschools. Preschools became very prominent. They became very open and welcome. And they started doing some tests for, for preschool kids, okay? And then we had all the, the all-inclusive preschool where you took kids from different... Right, that had different uh, issues, issues as well as kids exactly. who didn't. So, right. so th they were all into one thing. What, what sign would you give a parent to say, if a child was doing a certain thing, you, you might want to... Clearly, if you have um, a child who has got a syndrome, for example, like Down syndrome, Okay. or, um, you know, even others that are far more uh, rare, you can already begin to predict. You clearly want to make sure that all of the systems are intact, that you mm -hmm. don't have a kid who may have a hearing problem, okay. um, or that a, a visual problem, for example, things like that. Those kids, we know, are already going to be at risk. Okay. So you want to make sure that you really are working then to do a lot of speech and language stimulation, mm -hmm. working on eye contact, right, those right, kinds of things. Right. And certainly if there is something that needs to be done, like aiding kids, which mm -hmm. we do now at very early ages, you know, uh, with hearing um, intervention and that kind of stuff. I'm more interested as well, because those are those that's like out there and you go, okay, I'm really interested in those kids who may have more subtle kinds of issues. 
So we talk about dyslexia now. That's okay. a big label, and it's right. a label that people say, oh, yeah, I know what that is. That's, that's the people can't read, right? And what I would say is that there is a spectrum, and we need to be aware of that because I think that when we begin to see kids who may have developmental language problems, so say, for example, uh, the kids that I see in early intervention, um, I'm very concerned about the need to make sure that we do as much as possible at that age mm -hmm. because some of these things you can mitigate early. Not that you can't continue to monitor and to immediately move in, but we have kids that could have certain things that we know are going to begin to be problems. So for example, we typically talk about 50 words at right. age two okay. because that's when kids begin to um, uh, combine words, okay. okay, for certain functions, okay. right? Daddy home mm -hmm. or want more, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you can also then have this thing where you might have a kid who's just more reserved. By 32, 36 months of age, you really can begin to say, you know what? This kid really is not producing or I'm having problems understanding this kid. But let me ask you a question. And that becomes a kid that you're going, you know what? Mm-mm. What about the home environment? The home environment is extremely important. Okay, because what if the language in the home environment isn't sort of conducive to what the overall language yeah. is? The kid is only hearing from mom exactly. or dad or brothers and sisters. Exactly. And consequently, is a disconnect somewhere along the line. Yeah. Okay, how do we, you handle something? How do, how do you know that it's from the environment, from the home, versus something that's internal? I think that a lot of times what you want to be thinking about is obviously the kid's physical history mm -hmm. and obviously is there a history of language and learning disabilities mm -hmm. in the family. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are immediate markers, right? Mm -hmm. But we do know that socioeconomic status, we do know that um, exposure, um, there's a wonderful um, researcher, Ann Van Cleek, who's in mm -hmm. uh, Dallas, and she talks about casual talk versus academic talk. Mm -hmm. So there, that's a very good question in the sense that in some families, academic talk is already something that children are exposed to before they mm -hmm. ever go to school because they have uh, parents that are committed to reading books to them. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a college education to do this. Mm -hmm. Or they are committed to talking to their children. Mm -hmm. They sit down and they have dinner time conversation. Mm -hmm. They're not in front of the flat screen. Right, right, right. They um, expose their kids to experiences and ideas, whether it's through talk, mm -hmm. whether it's through just taking a walk through, mm -hmm. you know, any kind of a museum or just walking in the woods or whatever it is, so that they are already exposed to those kinds of behaviors that we associate with mm -hmm. uh, kids who tend to be higher academic mm -hmm. achievers. So we know that socioeconomic status can be a problem. If a, if a parent has to be out working two jobs or three jobs, mm -hmm. or you have, um, for example, parents that may be from wealthy, They could be wealthy and have nannies or whoever takes care of that's what Johnny or Jill. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. This is something that cuts across mm -hmm. uh, income levels, but we also know that typically um, if, you, if you have these kinds of cultural situations where you really don't have access to um, early preschool mm -hmm. or you have access to quality early preschool, although Head Start has been getting, has been mm -hmm. getting higher and higher, uh, standards and, and much better grades. I think that what begins to happen is that we still have to be aware of kids who are at risk. This troubles me because I think that, again, going back to my experience at Greenwich Hospital, we sat down and we worked with the, in, with the pediatricians, speech language pathologists saying to the pediatricians, look, this is what we need to be looking at. And w suddenly, we weren't getting kids at two years of age or two and a half. We were getting kids at 14, 15 months of age. And I think that that is significant. And then as I was saying to you earlier, what we also began to do was, because it was a community, we had the special ed, the head of special ed who would come in all the time with school age mm -hmm. kids, you know, and, say, and we'd sit down and we would talk about this. And we, because a lot of times we were providing additional services for those kids. And then I think also too, that you wanted to try to work with teachers and things as much as possible. Now, if you're in an environment where the speech language pathologist, for example, we get into these roles in school, 
psychologist does this, you know, it's looking at intelligence and looking at mm -hmm. those kinds of discrepancies between uh, IQ testing and, you know, what the language thing is. The speech pathologist may be giving a few tests and then we get all this, this data. Um, and then the reading teacher has their own piece or whatever, the classroom teacher. What begins to happen is you get this kind of fragmentation. And I think that what uh, speech pathologists like me are doing is saying no. What we need to be thinking about is all of these things. So if you think about it in terms of five areas, you think about it in terms of cognition and memory. Mm -hmm. You think about it in terms of social emotional development. You think about it in terms of sensory and motor. Okay. This gets into dysgraphia and things like that. You think about it importantly in terms of oral language development. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that what we begin to think about then is, oh, and executive functioning, which is how so, we... So let me ask you a question. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, a new school system is being built. Right. Okay. And they call Nancy in to set it up. To, not, the, <laughs> not, the school not the system, system but, but, but the special, but the, the speech language pathologist part yeah. of the system. How would you draft people in and what would their responsibility and how would they work within a team, collectively work as a team uh, together to meet the needs of this child now? It's no longer the kindergarten kid through the 12th grade. It's now the, the, the newborn versus going through until they get to the kindergarten or preschool. How, 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 would, you, how would you address that? The Commissioner of Education in Massachusetts <laughs> yeah, calls right. on Nancy to come down and, 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 work with these, and work with these people and set up this program. I think that one of the things that we need to be thinking about in terms of um, these kinds of systems mm -hmm. uh, is philosophy. Mm -hmm. I was just listening to um, Daniel Kahneman who wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow. Mm -hmm. And what he talks about is our realities mm -hmm. and that we get into what we think is the reality and how we think about it and we don't realize that there are other realities out there that really that we just don't consider because it's outside of our realm of experience mm -hmm. we've already set up what we think is reality mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. in experience and so therefore we don't think about what we can really do in terms of maybe modifying our ideas to be um, more inclusive or to be more um, uh, expansive in terms of our thinking. So I think that a lot of times in terms of these systems, whether it's early intervention or whether it's schools, we have certain philosophies. Mm -hmm. And so the issue with the philosophy is it becomes program driven. And I think that one of the things that we have to think about in terms of programs is how are we going to best serve a child now? But this, what's the, what's the, schools can't do it all. No, this is the issue. No, and no, we, and we no, ask no, schools no. to do a huge, a huge amount. amount. Right. And I've seen some just extraordinary teachers, but I think that sometimes what happens is we get into our programs and, and we're program driven. Mm -hmm. And we don't realize that, you know what, maybe this program really isn't working because we think it's working. Well, because we have these scores. And then you hear this, my, one of my famous uh, quotes is, slow but steady progress. But how do, how do we, you know, um, if you we were talking. across cross domains yeah, is what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, but if you, were in a, if you were talking from an athletic point of view, okay, yeah. and a coaching point of view, and a coach came in and saw his players, uh, and the coordinator of the coaches saw some of the coaches and players doing certain things, but it wasn't efficient enough. Yeah. So normally the, they're always on the learning curve. They're always getting into the new learning curve. And they go back to them and say, okay, we've done this and we see it. it only gets us this far. But now if we implement this, it could get us this far and closer to the championship, okay? So what I'm trying to say is, right. should the system, the school systems across the country who are having the troubles with the speech and language of kids and whatnot, is it a sense of more training, more uh, awareness, and becoming more open to change? All of those you know, things. Because sometimes you can say, change, it, it, we got the change, we got the ingredient here, but yeah, but I'm not going to use it. I'm using my own recipe. Exactly. You know? I, I, I like the analogy, but the thing with, athlet, with athletics is it's about winning. Mm -hmm. And so... And you know one thing? 
I know what you're going to say, I think. But you know one thing? When that child changes and becomes successful... Then they're winning. You're winning. Exactly. But I think that what has happened is, is that we've fallen into literacy rates in America mm -hmm. are dropping across the country. Mm -hmm. And certainly we have significant literacy problems here. I think that what has happened is in education is that in teacher training programs, mm -hmm. they have become um, targeted by corporations who sell them a certain program. You got it. And so that what happens is, is that teachers aren't actually trained to, to be the kind of person that steps back. A lot of teachers, for example, don't know very much about their own language because they don't have to take a language course. I mean, but is it because the corporations that are developing these things are not even asking teachers or pathologists to be a part of helping make the change, the needs? You know what I mean? You, you know, I'm not so sure that a lot of times, um, in general, mm -hmm. generally speaking, that teachers and speech pathologists feel the need to make a change. Okay. Yeah. And I don't mean that in a critical way. I think that what <coughs> happens is, again, going back to that original thing, you've got these systems, mm -hmm. and the systems have a philosophy, and this is our philosophy, and this is how you have to do it. So if you come in and say, you know, look, I'm a little bit concerned about this because, for example, as a speech-language pathologist, I need to really focus on this kid because I want to make sure that I'm maximizing my time with that child. I, you know, I can get pushback. Well, that's not how we do it. Mm -hmm. That's not our... That's not our philosophy. And so what ends up happening is you're sitting there going, okay, so now I've got this system that I'm trying to deal so with. So what happens when they know they got an issue? What are they going to do with it? Just kick it under the rug? I think that a lot of times, again, going back to Kahneman's point, I think the reality is is that their reality doesn't allow for that kind of thinking. And so as somebody who has always worked outside of systems, right, so I can work across these domains that I was talking about before, um, and then, of course, getting heavily invested years ago, decades ago, in literacy and written language, that I think that what ends up happening is, is that people don't understand that oral language and written language are dependent upon each other, but they are different systems. The brain is not wired to learn to read and write. The brain is wired for oral language. And so I think that when we give up certain things like handwriting, mm -hmm. when we give up certain things like teacher training in which teachers are heavily invested, particularly in the early years, with not only handwriting but phonics, which go together. A lot of teachers don't know that much about phonics. They don't know that much about the structure of language, but they say, well, we've got this whole word system, we've got this, and, and so I, what ends up happening is I see kids in elementary school, middle school, and disturbingly in high school still guessing at words and you can't guess at a word you have to have the strategies for how you're going to do something and I think that that's where we fall down and now in education we have all of these scores and then you'll see a comment well we'll talk about this later mm -hmm. you know in a meeting instead of saying okay this is where the breakdowns are or what we perceive to be the breakdowns to be at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's a snapshot. Right. And so therefore, these are the materials that we need to use, and this is the methodology. Yes. We don't see that anymore. We've got a minute and 30 seconds. How could you or people get in touch with you to help you help them through this transition period in their lives with their kids? Well, we have the Moffitt's Vineyard Language and Literacy Project, okay. and that's online at okay at mvllp.org. Mm -hmm. And also people can just contact me uh, as a private practitioner. Mm -hmm. I think that people don't realize that speech language pathologists like myself, who have got both clinical and therapeutic training, that we are also um, credentialed by mm -hmm. um, insurance companies and we have to carry malpractice insurance. Mm -hmm. So I think that if parents begin to understand that it's not just the school speech language mm -hmm. pathologist, but it's somebody who's looking out for your kid across a number of domains. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we need to try to work uh, collaboratively with pediatricians, interested teachers. Not all teachers mm -hmm. are interested. Mm -hmm. And I think that certainly we need to redefine what speech language pathology mm -hmm. can be so that we can work more productively with psychologists uh, and therapists and reading teachers and classroom teachers to really make a difference. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for coming on. And I want to thank you for tuning into Tank Talk. And until next time, this is your host, Bob Tankard, saying good evening. <laughs>